Our scripture reading this morning uh, comes out of Ephesians. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father of everything, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord for us. Uh, good morning. It's good to be back with you this morning. I uh, didn't expect to be up here quite again so soon, but here we are. Uh, today is the, the first Sunday of the new year, and we're, we're starting a new sermon series uh, today, and it's called Redeeming Your Time. And the series is all about taking a biblical approach to how we manage our time. Um, for a lot of us, including myself, uh, sometimes in busyness of life, it can be hard to kind of manage our time uh, as we try to kind of proportion it out to the different areas of our life because uh, we need to spend time with our family, but we also need to go to church, and we also need to uh, spend time in the Word. We also need to uh, get some rest. We also need to catch up with our friends, and so uh, sometimes it can just be really hard to, to balance all those different areas of your life, and I think we've all felt the, the stress of a, a busy schedule and it can be very overwhelming. And so this series is kind, of, is kind of focused on that problem. We're going to dive into the scriptures and see what uh, the word says about how we spend our time, how we steward our time well, and how we're productive as followers of Jesus. So that's what we'll be studying. Uh, and what's crazy is if you, if you went to Google right now and you went, and you went to the search bar and you typed in, Good time management. Uh, the first picture that would pop up would be a big picture of John Reisner and his plethora of children uh, that him and Rachel managed to get to all their soccer practices and Bible quizzing and everything else that they do. Because uh, John truly is like uh, the, the perfect person to be preaching on this. Um, but somewhat ironically, John is sick this week, and so instead you are going to be hearing from the, the 22-year-old who is still learning to use a, a planner for the first time. Uh, so, so bear with me this morning. Uh, but no, I, I'm very excited to, to dive into the scriptures this morning, to spend time in God's word, um, because I, I do believe that the Bible has a lot to say on this subject. Uh, so that's, wh that's what we're going to do. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 15 is where we'll be starting. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have an opportunity this morning to submit ourselves to it. To, to learn from you, to be guided by you, Lord. 
I pray that this morning you would help us as we seek to be better stewards of our time. Lord, I pray that you would um, give us the strength and the wisdom that is required to, to live that out. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So the, this passage that we just read from Ephesians is kind of the, the passage that's going to be the foundation for this series. Uh, because here in verse 16, we have this biblical command to make the most of every opportunity. Um, or in the NKJB, they, they actually translate it as redeeming your time, hence the, the title of the series. Uh, but the original Greek word here that is, is used is exagorazo, which means to buy from. Uh, so literally, Paul is instructing believers to buy back their time. Uh, and that's exactly what we want to do with this series. Uh, we're trying to do, uh, do through this study is we want to buy back our time. We want to use our time well instead of wasting it or, or being inefficient. And so today, that's where we're going to be basing our study is here in this passage because I, I really do think it has a lot to offer us when we um, consider how to use our time properly. Um, so let's, let's dive into the text here. So, as I already mentioned, uh, we're studying from the book of Ephesians, and Ephesians is an, uh, an epistle, it is a letter, it was written by Paul to the early church, uh, and it's, it's been used for century upon century to instruct the church as we seek to know Christ and to serve his kingdom. And so, many of you have probably read Ephesians before, uh, many times over, because it's a great book, and you might know that one of the, the main themes in the book of Ephesians is this theme of redemption. And that fancy Greek word that I said earlier, exagorazo, it's actually often translated as redemption. So when we're talking about a theme of redemption here, we're talking about this theme of God buying something back. So Paul spends a lot of his epistle talking about God's master plan for redemption. Right, God has set in place a plan of redemption that involves redeeming not just on a personal level, but also on a, a, a cosmic level. Meaning, God has redeemed believers on, a, on this, this personal level where right, Christ has uh, been sent to die for our sin. He paid the debt for our sin. And so we're redeemed on this personal level. But then God also plans to redeem not just people, but all of creation. And so in, in chapter 1 of, of verse 10 of Ephesians, uh, it says, God has a, a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So that's kind of this plan of cosmic redemption that he's been talking about. Uh, so it's kind of like what Mark George talked about last week, where he's talking about God bringing creation back to himself, God restoring Eden, uh, because God is restoring this union between heaven and earth and between God and man. And so this then is when the church becomes not just this random group of people that get together on Sunday morning, uh, but the church is instead this, this, this little pocket of, of Eden, so to say, in a dark world, uh, almost like uh, this little colony of the kingdom of God. Uh, because we know, right, that the, the Spirit is, is among us this morning, we're gathered together, and the Spirit also indwells us, each of us as, as believers. And so when the world looks at us, they see this, this reunion between, between God and man, right, where humanity and God are living in communion with one another, once again, just like in Eden. And so the church is the first fruits of this master plan for redemption in which God is buying back all of creation, uh, so when we look at the church, we, we see this glimpse at this, at this future hope of a future, future restoration uh, where God will unite all things in him. So Paul spends much of Ephesians kind of establishing that theme of redemption, establishing this reality that we've been reconciled to God and seated with Christ. But then... As we move into the latter half of Ephesians, Paul uses these truths about Christ redeeming us 
to exhort the church to live in light of that reality. In other words, Paul is saying, okay, because God did this, because he's unfolding this master plan of redemption for you, because he's redeemed you, now we do this. Now we live in response to this. And that's actually how, how Paul structured a lot of his, his letters in the New Testament. He would start off with the good news of the gospel. He'd lay out the gospel, make it clear, and then say, because of this truth, because of this gospel, now you ought to, you ought to live a certain way. So why do, I, why do I mention all of this, right? We're, we're supposed to be talking about redeeming your time, and I'm rambling about uh, God, God's redemption in Ephesians. Um, so why am I talking about this redemption stuff? Well, for one, I wanted to establish the context of Ephesians before we get to the verse that we're going to study for today. Uh, but also, I, I wanted to talk about this theme of redemption in Ephesians because it prepares us to receive the instruction about how we ought to make the most of the time. Uh, Because I think when I get up here and I say, okay, church, it's time to start thinking about how we spend our time, I think many of us immediately start to stress out uh, and and we think about all the time that we've wasted uh, because, honestly, we have wasted a lot of time. But my goal this morning is is not to make you feel bad about that, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to start with establishing Christ's message of redemption that's laid out in the Bible and especially here in Ephesians. Because church, we need to understand that while we do need to do more with our time, uh, we could spend every passing second of every passing day for the rest of our lives serving the Lord wholeheartedly. Um, to the best of our ability, and we could still never repay Christ for what he's done for us. And I I think many of us forget that, and instead we convince ourselves that we need to to earn God's favor, that we need to earn God's love, that somehow if we just give enough of our time to the Lord, that we'll, we'll really prove ourselves to him, and then He'll love us, then he'll save us. And then we end up trying to give all of our time to God, and we just give and we give, and it's never enough, and you stress yourself out, and you think God's love is dependent on how much time you give him, and eventually you just crash and you burn, and you end up doing, doing nothing instead of anything. And, and that's what happens when we try to, to earn our salvation, because we can't. And, and so I just, I wanted to be cautious, because when, when someone tells us that we need to redeem our time for God, I think often we take that good biblical command, and we remove it from its, its gospel root. You're already loved by God. In fact, he, he loved you while you were still a sinner. He loved you while you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. Which means that you've done nothing to earn his favor. Uh, You've done nothing to earn his love. Zero percent. You're saved by grace through faith, not your works. And so that's what I wanted to to make sure we understood the context of what we're talking about this morning. Uh, We have to understand Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 where Paul really lays out this message of redemption before we ever move on to um, this, this command to redeem our time. Because we need to understand that we're saved in order that we might do good works. Uh, We are not saved because of our good works. So God has redeemed us. He's redeemed the church. And because he's redeemed us, because we are now his possession, then we are free to actually start participating in God's work of redeeming all of creation and reuniting all things under the lordship of Christ. But we can't. We can't mix up that thought process in our mind because sometimes I think we just jump to the end where we have to do stuff, right? We have to grasp the root, which is the gospel of grace uh, before we get to the fruit of the gospel, which is, is then good works. And in this, w- in this case, uh, this would be, the fruit would be making the most of our time for God's kingdom. So 
now that we've established that, uh, let's, let's look at our verses for today. So verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So Paul, in this, in this part of the letter, he's instructing the church to be holy and to be set apart as they seek to walk in the light and not in the darkness. And so he spends a lot of chapter 5 kind of warning the church about the ways of the world. Uh, and then we get to verse 15 and 16 here, and Paul is saying, because you're called to be the light, right, because you're called to be this, this, this pocket of Eden on earth, because you're a city on a hill, you have to live differently from the world. You have to stand out from the, the present darkness. And so to do that, you have to be careful, as a believer, you have to be careful how you live. You have to be wise because the world is watching. And then wisdom requires that you make the best use of your time. Make the best use of your time. And so the question then becomes, well, what is the best use of my time? Well, to answer that, I think we need to keep reading here. Verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Church, if we want to be wise with our time, then we have to understand the will of the Lord. When we understand the will of the Lord, then what we do becomes worthwhile. Uh, because we're no longer spending our time just doing something on a whim because we feel like it. Uh, but we're doing things because we believe it to be in line with the will of the Lord. And then the follow-up question to that is, well, how do we know the will of the Lord? Well, we read his word. We soak in it. We study it. We dwell on it. Meditate on it day and night. All right, we just... We don't just uh, read the verse of the day and call it a day. No. We have, to, we have to dive into the word. Really study it. Buy, buy a commentary. I don't know. Uh, because God uh, reveals himself through his word. And to discover the will of the Lord, we have to be saturated in the word. Which means that the time that you, you spend in the morning... Not in bed, but out in your, in your living room with your cup of coffee with the word of God. It's not, it's not a waste of your time. In fact, it's, it's actually probably uh, the best use of your time. Because the word then helps us to spend our time wisely. So, if we want to be good stewards of our time, we must first... Study the word of God. So, so remember that this week as, as you're possibly tempted to, to kind of shrug off your Bible reading. If you don't spend time in his word, you're going you're gonna to default to living on autopilot, right, where you, where you live with no sense of purpose. And I think, I think many of you might be there, right? Many of you are living on autopilot, and it, it causes you to wonder if your life even has, has meaning because you're just going through the motions, motions. And so if that's you, my question for you this morning is, are you in the word of God? And not just, not just for, for five minutes. Are you, are, you, are you really studying it? Because the word of God reminds us of our, our purpose. It reminds us that we've been set apart by a sovereign Lord to, to be a people for his own possession. It reminds us that we're, we're sent out as ambassadors for Christ into a dark world. It's in Scripture that we find purpose and we find encouragement in order to face each day. As Charles Spurgeon 
once said, uh, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. If we, we're rooted in Scripture, we are going to be more effective with how we spend our time. Guaranteed. Let's keep reading to the end of verse 21. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now, Paul seems to almost, almost randomly bring up drunkenness. So right before this, he's talking, about, he's talking about being wise, making the best use of our time, and, and suddenly he brings up drunkenness. Uh, now, obviously, drunkenness is unwise, but why, why bring up this sin and not any other sin? Why does he just suddenly start talking about drunkenness? Well, I think Paul brings this up because drunkenness, the, the drunkard, is, is kind of this, this perfect picture of someone who is, who is living for the moment. Right? The drunkard has no concern for tomorrow. He lives to feel good right now. Right? He doesn't care about work in the morning. He doesn't care about the hangover he's going to have. He just wants to feel good for tonight. And so I think that Paul here is not not just saying don't get drunk. I mean, I mean he is saying that. Uh, but I think the, the even bigger point that he's making here is don't pursue pleasure. Don't live like the drunkard who has no concern for tomorrow. Right? Because, church, if we want to be wise with our time, we can't live as though tomorrow is guaranteed. We can't live for temporary pleasure. We can't be caught off guard. Because if, if the Bible makes, makes one thing clear about time, it's that often we think we have much more of it than we actually do. In Matthew chapter 24, Christ warns us about the nature of his second coming. And he says this, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. We have to live as though those words are true. We can't, we can't be like the people of Noah's day who, who had no knowledge that their days were numbered. That, that can't be us, church. That can't be MCA. We, we have to be vigilant. We have to keep our foot on the gas. Because there's work to be done. If we want to be wise with our time, we have to live as though tomorrow is not promised. Growing up, uh, I, always, I always looked up to my grandpa, Abe. Um, he loved his family. Uh, he loved his, his work. But, but above everything else, he loved Jesus. Uh, he, was, he was a pastor for, for 35 years, um, and he did everything for, for God's glory. Uh, and he, 
he impacted countless people. And so he, he passed away back in 2017, uh, but he, he spent his last few weeks or so in hospice care. And I remember hearing this, sh- this story about how on one of the, the last kind of nights that he was aware enough to, to hold a conversation, one of the, one of the nurses had, had gone into his room to check on him. And, and he, was, he was in a lot of pain, and his body was, was very tired and worn out. But the nurse told us that all he could talk about, all he could talk about that night was just how excited he was to go meet Jesus, to go get to be with Jesus. And I, I tell you that story because it's the perfect illustration of what life looks like when we live expectantly awaiting the return of Christ, either when he comes to us or when we go to him. If we live life with, the, with eternity at the forefront of our mind, if we live knowing that our struggles are, are nothing compared to the glory that awaits us in Christ, like, like Abe, it, it allows us to face death itself without fear. Right? And, and that, that's the kind of life that I want to live. And I, hopefully that's the kind of life that you want to live. Where Christ is, is so real, he's so tangible that, that I can have joy even in the, the hardest moments of my life. So, all that to say, if, if we want to be wise with our time, we have to have eternity in our minds. We have to live as though tomorrow is not promised. Finally, if we want to be wise with our time, I think we need to take verses 19 through 21 to heart. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's a lot that I could, I could say about these verses, but I'll keep it brief. The essence of what Paul is saying here to the church is this. As you, as you seek to be careful how you walk, as you seek to be wise with your time, do these things. Be filled with the Spirit. Worship the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Exhort one another. And love one another. And if you really think about it, these verses kind of paint a picture of what we do here in our Sunday morning gatherings. We gather together. The Spirit is among us. We sing praises to the Lord and we give thanks to the Lord. We love one another. We encourage one another. And so, I guess the the last thing I want to say about being wise with our time is, is don't don't neglect this. Right? Don't, don't think of this as an inconvenience. When, when you gather together with the Lord's people and you worship and you, you see your friends and you ask them about their week, don't, don't take that for granted. I don't, I don't think it's crazy to think that we might not always get to do this like we're doing it right now. We don't know what the future might hold. We don't know when persecution might come. It could be tomorrow. We don't know. Might not 
always be able to gather in a, a public setting like this and, and worship the Lord together. So let's, let's not take this for granted because I, I really do think there's going to be a day when the people of God, they look back on our generation and they think, why were these people so casual about church? Did they, did they not understand what they had? that they could gather openly and worship the Lord together frequently. They know what gift they have. So then, church, let's be wise with our time this week. Let's remain firmly rooted in the truth of the gospel. Let's Let's dive into the word. Let's study it. Let's soak in it. Let's not live for temporary pleasure, but let's live as people with eternity at the forefront of our minds. And then when the week is done, uh, let's get back together next week and worship God again and prepare for the week ahead. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. Thank you that we have such a, a beautiful opportunity to gather together on Sundays, to worship together, to encourage one another, Lord. I pray that we would take this command to be wise with our time, Lord, that we would take that command seriously, that we would not be living for temporary pleasure, that we wouldn't be living on autopilot, Lord, but that um, above everything else, Lord, we'd have a desire to serve your kingdom, to be a city on a hill, to be this little pocket of Eden in a dark world, Lord. I pray that we would um, be encouraged this morning. I pray that as we go from here, Lord, your Holy Spirit would empower us to serve one another, submit to one another, love one another. Um, but Lord, above all else, I pray that um, you would be glorified this week in how we spend our time. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.